saying she was absolutely appalled at the fact that Bill Oddy was thrashing this poor defenceless horse. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I had to write back, it's honestly true, I had to write back and say, he wasn't a real horse. <laughs> he wasn't a real horse, that was Tim and Graham in a skin. <laughs> and she wrote back saying, well, that's all right then. That's all right. That's all right. All right. More of this, please. <laughs> Still to come on The Return of the Goodies, the boys are reunited with their trusty Trandom. This is blood! Congealed blood, this is our blood! We unearth the Goodies' greatest epic. And what they did before they were Goodies. Goodies, goody, goody, yum, yum. The comedy roots of Tim, Bill and Graham stretch right back to the early 60s. To a time when the new comic voice on TV was smart, sophisticated and satirical. The week that was, it's over, let it be. A Queen Elizabeth doll and a Jackie Kennedy doll with interchangeable underwear have been on sale in a New York store. <laughs> the Jackie Kennedy doll has now been withdrawn because the White House thought it undignified. In the early 60s, um, British comedy underwent a bit of a revolution. We were sort of, we still had the sort of music hall tradition uh, of the sort of end of the pier stuff. If you can see what I can see when I'm cleaning windows... The Footlights and the University Brigade were bringing through a more intelligent form of comedy, which came through in the satire boom with That Was The Week That Was and Beyond The Fringe. Perkins? Sir? I want you to lay down your life. Yes, sir. We need a futile gesture at this stage. <laughs> Peter Cook's success with Beyond the Fringe and David Frost's groundbreaking TV satire put the media spotlight on their comic origins, the Cambridge Footlights. As undergraduates, Tim, Bill and Graham were in the perfect position to be part of this fashionable new breeding ground for cutting-edge comedy. First contact I ever had with the Footlights was at this weird thing called the Society's Fair. There were all these people sitting behind desks and things, sort of advertising their wares and saying, join the Christian society and this sort of thing. No, over here for the beagling, you know, and, this, and they really were in those days. They were sort of hunting, shooting and fishing societies as well as various other things, um, including various drama things. I auditioned in front of Tim, uh, who was the president, uh, and uh, he rather graciously let me in. Uh, so that's how I joined. The great thing about Footlights in those days was people were actually totally unpretentious. They weren't the actors that were born lovies. They were people that felt slightly stupid and did it for fun. Also flexing their comic muscles between lectures at that time were a couple of future pythons, Graham Chapman and John Cleese. Tim was an almost perfect example of a fairly confident public school chap. So, uh, you're interested in joining the Secret Service, are you? Yes, I am. Splendid, splendid. And he was funny, fairly conventional in his thinking, and very easy company. Young men with good nerves. You have good nerves, have you? Yes, I think so. Good. They're absolutely vital in the kind of work that everybody's doing. <laughs> Two or three times a term, they would put on smoking concerts that members would try out material and hopefully the best material from the smoking concerts would make up the review at the end of the, uh, the year. Graham was almost professorial in a very attractive way, but, I mean, Graham would go quietly to his desk in the evening and sit there for four hours, and what he was up to, I never knew. Bill was more eccentric. He didn't give a damn about his dress, which always endeared him to me. He was the only one of us who was really talented musically. My father is a beetle and my ma's a rolling stone. Probably the funniest thing I've ever been in is a, a sketch which was basically written by John Cleese. David Hatch had a hand in, in fact we all did a bit because it was ad-libbed, called Judge Not. We waited a year for that flipping sketch. It became a running joke at university because every time we came to do one of these Footlights um, shows at the end of the term, we said, John, have you done your sketch? No, I'm still working on it, still working on it. It took him the whole damn year, and then finally, in the final show, he said, yeah, I, I think it's sort of ready, you know. And, um, and it was brilliant. <laughs> now, you are Percy Molar? That is correct, yes. You are a company director? I am. <laughs> 
satirical comedy was going on in London was that was the week that was. I think the Footlights weren't terribly interested in all that, the, the, this little generation, because we were doing uh, sort of silliness, really, and surrealism. Our idea was to make ourselves laugh, and if we made ourselves laugh, then hopefully the audience would. Cleese's Judge Not Sketch was included in Cambridge Circus, the Footlights Review of 1963. And starring alongside John Cleese and Graham Chapman in the show were Bill and Tim. One of the best reviews, I think, that I remember was this little phrase, inspired dottiness, which I think was a brilliant description of what was going on in Cambridge Circus. Cambridge Circus caught the eye of London theatre impresario Michael White, who financed a hit West End run. This led to a transfer to the glittering lights of New York's Broadway. A Footlights feat that's never been matched before or since. We opened to very good reviews from a chap called Walter Kerr, who was the biggest critic at that time in Broadway. He loved us. The other five newspapers hated us. But uh, in the middle of our performances in uh, America, we got an invitation to go on The Ed Sullivan Show. Now, from the Plymouth Theatre, the stage of the Plymouth Theatre on West 45th Street, the London stars of the simply hilarious review Cambridge Circus present their first number, the amusing London Bus. So let's have a fine welcome for these. We were told that somewhere between 70 and 90 million people were watching live. Well, 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 here comes William. I say, William, what are you doing here? I'm waiting for a London bus. For the London bus. Yes, the London bus. It was like the gospel train with city gents. And we started discussing which way you get to, to, to work. And it slipped into this thing about, you go on a Green Line bus. Yeah, it's a Green Line bus. That's a Green Line bus. It goes to Camden Town. Well, it goes up there, the wind's going down. Well, you've got to stand up when you want to sit down. Of course, this is 1964. If I'd done it in Harlem, I'd have been shot. After a year spent touring the USA, Bill and Tim returned to London. And together with Graham, they set their sights on the other home of British comedy, BBC Radio, where they would help create the hugely successful sketch show, I'm Sorry, I'll Read That Again. And now, here is an urgent terrapin joke. I see, I see, I see, I see. Who was that terrapin I saw you with last night? That was no terrapin. That was our old schoolmistress. She taught us. Whilst Graham finished his medical studies, Bill honed his comic songwriting skills on the Beeb, with a couple of spots on the topical late-night sketch show, BBC Three. Cos poor old Roma got no goals at all. <laughs> but out of the three soon-to-be goodies, it was Tim who got the first big television break. Well, I don't know whether I like it or not. Yes, oh, no. Yes, I do like it. Thank you. Yes, it's at last the 1948 show. In 1967, David Frost, by then an executive producer for ITV, gave Tim top billing alongside John Cleese, Graham Chapman and rising star Marty Feldman in a collection of comedy sketches called At Last the 1948 Show. We had it tough. I used to have to get out at shoebox at midnight, lit road clean, <laughs> eat a couple of bits of cold gravel, work 23 hours a day at mill for a penny every four years, and when we and when we got home, Dad used to slice us in half with a bread knife. It was a complete mix, the 48 show. It was like uh, Monty Python meets the goodies, really, when you look back with hindsight. John Cleese was always the, the charismatic one, playing these dominating characters or these stiff-up lip characters or these very conventional men who would suddenly explode in rage or hysteria. Come on, come on, yes, spit it out. What's well, I'm teasing about the bush. The roots of Basil Fawlty were there. So will you please tell me, once and for all, in God's name, what's the matter with you? Tim Brooke Taylor has a wonderful line in flapping and panic and people uh, sweating and getting out of control. And you could see all this uh, emerging, which, uh, you know, reached the fruition in the goodies. I think I'm a rabbit. 
Fuck you, stupid loony! Caution on a rabbit! I have yourself to do! 